Hi everyone, how are you doing? All right. How many of you had wine over lunch? Yeah, me too. Please try not to fall asleep. I've got some. I've, I've put a cheeky, painful video in here that will lance you awake in case you start to drift off. So. My name is Natalie Nahai, and I'm a web psychologist, which means that I'm interested in how our online environments, like websites and apps and newsletters, persuade us at a primarily subconscious level to behave in certain ways. Today's talk, I'm going to be looking particularly at empathy, which is something that we've heard a little bit about today. We're going to start with a brief introduction, who I am, what I do. We're going to have a look at the metaphorical three systems of the brain. We're then going to look at empathy, and then also um, a little bit about what you heard Susan Weinstein talk about earlier, about neural coupling and storytelling. A couple of videos in there to prove a point. And then there's going to be five steps that you can use to implement empathy online. So how do you actually apply it in your disciplines? I've put all of these slides up. You'll be getting an automated tweet at about 2.15, 2.20 from, uh, from my account, which is at the website which you can download, so I don't feel like you have to frantically scribble down any notes. So a quick introduction. Um, I have a background in psychology, in design and coding, and in performance. And uh, about a year and a bit ago, I put all of this together, and I published a book called Webs of Influence. And basically, it brought together loads of different research from various disciplines. I'll talk about that in just a sec. These are some of the people I've spoken with and about this particular subject, which is web psychology which I define as the empirical study of how our online environments influence our attitudes and our behaviours. It draws from a whole bunch of different fields. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with some of these. So things like human-computer interaction and the broader computer sciences, cross-cultural psychology, which is something I'm particularly interested in, UX, social, neuroesthetics, cognitive, behavioural economics, the list kind of goes on. So if you think of web psychology as being like the diamond on which all of these facets of different types of disciplines intersect, that's kind of how I perceive it. In a nutshell, it's about understanding the context of the people that you're trying to reach. And that includes us as consumers. So it's about the cultural context of your audience and the individual context. In all the research that I did for the book, I found that people who were really successful online had three things that they did to be that successful. There are three secrets to online success. The first, know who you're targeting. We all know about demographics, but how many of us stop to think about, about the psychography of our online audience? their age, their gender, their personality traits, the subcultures from whether they're from Hockstitch or whether they're from Brighton versus uh, broader macro-cultural differences. Once you understand the psychographic lay of the land of your audience, you can then figure out the best way in which to communicate persuasively with them, which is what we're going to look at today with empathy. The third and final point about being successful online deals with the application of persuasive techniques that are used or sourced from principally psychology and other behavioral sciences, to be able to use persuasion tactics in a way that is um, beneficial to your end users. What I mean by this, uh, or to highlight this, recently I had a podcast with Robin Dreek, who is the head of the behavioral analysis team at the FBI. And I asked him, what's the difference between persuasion and manipulation? Because we were, you know, we're all dancing in the gray in this particular area. And he said that for him the difference was intent, your intent for your customer. So by that, I mean, if I came today to, to, to speak with you guys, and my intention was that after this interaction, you'll go away feeling hopefully more enriched for having had this interaction, or feeling better, or feeling empowered, or feeling happy, that that would have been a positive intent for each and every one of you. That's where persuasion steps in. Manipulation is where you kind of disregard the benefits for your potential customer, and it's all self-centered, so kind of the black hat versus white hat. So let's dive in, because you've only got 35 minutes together. So um, I'm going to start off with the idea of the three systems brain. Susan earlier sort of flashed up a side, which is really interesting, which looked at uh, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. And this is a really, really useful metaphor to be able to understand the different systems that we're trying to engage with as designers um, or in whatever we're doing in business, whenever it involves another human that we're trying to influence, to figure out which levels we need to interact on. So it consists of three main metaphors, well, three main systems. You've got the primal, the emotional, and the rational. I'm going to give you a brief introduction, and then we're going to dive into empathy, which kind of sits within more of the emotional system. So the primal system. It's the oldest. We share it with all other animals. 
It also takes care of basic vital functions, things like digestion, heart rate, uh, also arousal levels. It's the part of the brain that looks after your survival and the freeze, fight and flight. So this is particularly useful in this day and age. We're all glued to our phones and you cross the street like I do and then you think, oh my God, I'm going to get hit by a bus. And you either freeze, which is what happened to me last week, which is not very fun, or you run um, or you fight if you're stimulated enough at that point. It also looks for opportunities for sex and for food. Online, this is useful for you as designers because you can do certain things to engage this system. Here are some of them. Cues for sex. We looked earlier about how um, round objects are more attractive than square objects. It's the same thing for symmetry. Symmetry is a cue of sexual fitness. If I look more beautiful and I happen to be symmetrical, which is a key indicator of beauty, then you're more likely to want to engage with me. Um, oh, sorry, okay. Images of food are also very important, and these don't have to be explicit. This, this can be something like um, having a, an image of maybe a half-eaten cupcake on a desk and you're a design company. You can also have things like motion, as we heard about earlier, and making messages contrasting and concrete. So um, to wrap those two points, motion and contrast and concrete, have, how many of you have seen that really awful black and white gif of the woman on the side? It's like one weird tip to lose belly fat. How many of you have seen that? She's like grabbing, and it goes, doo -doo 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 -doo, and you're like, stop blinking at me. And you, you're watching this thing, and you're not going to click because it's irrational, and we know that it's a scam. But we keep looking at it. Why? Because of motion, because of contrast, and it's concrete. And we love mystery. The use of language is super important. Anyway, um, we also tend to like end experiences, which is this sort of weird phenomenon where if I have a cake, uh, the last piece of that cake, I'm going to typically think of as being more exciting and delicious and wonderful than those preceding mouthfuls. So online, this is quite useful. You can do things such as, um, to give you a great example, when you're checking out and your customers finally decided to buy whatever it is that you're selling and you've got all those fields to fill in, most of us do the asterisk. You need to do this thing here. And if you don't, and it's in red, if you don't do it, we're going to penalize you and then you're going to be screwed because you're not going to know which, full, which thing to fill in. What about instead, instead of penalizing people for wanting to buy your stuff, what about if you gave them a tick every time they got a piece of the form right? This has proven to be really, really good at increasing an emotional engagement that's positive at the very end of a process so they leave on a high. Think about how you can help people to leave on a high. The final one is around scarcity. Scarcity of product, scarcity of time. Things like limited time sales, etc., play really well into this system. The emotional system, which is where we're going to be focusing. This is uh, thought to be the limbic system. It's also the area of the brain which is pretty ancient and automatic. And it's also where we find the amygdala, which is sort of maligned to be the seat of fear in the brain. It is very important when it comes to fear responses, but it's also the part of the brain that lights up and gets active when we're looking for relevant stimuli within our situation. So if I am starving and I am hungry, this part of the brain becomes active when I see stimuli for food. Or, for instance, if I'm ovulating for sex. Um, it's also interesting because it's been implicated in facial recognition studies in which we're looking at faces to figure out trust cues as to whether or not we can trust the person that we might be buying from. So it's implicated in that as well. It's also where you find the thalamus, or to put it in another way, it's kind of dubbed the grand central station of emotional processing in the brain. And some of the key emotions that we're going to look at in a little bit that it processes are things like happiness, sadness, and disgust. Disgust is a very, very, very interesting one um, because it, it elicits a very, very strong visceral response. And a lot of the stuff that goes viral is often disgusting. Um, I didn't put this video in this talk. Who here has seen the, the talk with the GoDaddy, sorry, the video with the GoDaddy um, hot woman and then the tech fat geek? Has anyone seen that? All right. When you get after this talk, Google GoDaddy um, as like hot woman, fat geek and see which character you identify with, and then figure out which emotion they're tapping into. We don't have the time to go into it now, but you'll see what I mean. It's also where you find the ventral tegmental area, which is the part of the brain that's packed, well, one of the areas of the brain that's packed with dopamine neurons, which is involved in risk and reward and pleasure seeking. Um, okay. These are some of the things that you can do to engage the emotional system of the brain if you are designing for your customers. Use empathy, which is what we're going to focus on next. You can also look, um, well, we're also going to look at mirror neurons, so I'm not going to go into too much about that. Also, move your clients from pain into pleasure. If you, can, if you can make it as concrete as possible, this is a great way of getting people to move through a story. So, something like um, home insurance. It's a very abstract concept. No one wants to do it. It's in the future. We're not thinking about it. 
In the US, there's a place, uh, there's a, an insurance called Allstate, and they've created this fictional character called Mayhem, who's this kind of rough, suit-wearing kind of guy. He's like, hi, my name's Mayhem. I'm going to cause havoc for da-da-da-da-da. And then all these different series of this personified Mayhem, he becomes someone who's like a, a teenage girl in a pink Jeep who crashes into your car, or too much snow that crashes onto your car that's in your garage, or like, um, not a muskrat, possum in your, in your roof eating all your insulation. That's a great way of moving someone from pain. This personified, horrible mayhem guy is going to get you. You should move away from this painful situation into getting all state because we are going to look after you, just as an example. Things like body language and storytelling are also very important, and we're going to touch on that momentarily. Is this too fast for you? Okay, brilliant. The rational brain. This is where we like to think we make our decisions. It's uh, where we also can think of system two as residing, the rational, thought-provoking, logical part of the brain. So it's thought to be unique to humans. Recent research has found that actually cetaceans, uh, that's dolphins and whales um, and other sort of mammals within that um, particular species, and also corvids, so things like ravens and magpies and jays and also... Um, Grey parrot. So lots of other species that actually exhibit uh, rational thought and the capability of um, abstract thought. But for this particular presentation, we're not trying to sell dolphin stuff online, so we're going to focus on humans. It's where you have your higher cognitive functions, and it's the ability to plan and organize and think for the future that resides here. It's also where it's thought that social learning and innovation takes place, and it's where uh, we tend to use, well, there's certain other areas implicated here as well, but language and um, abstract thinking. Online, we like to think that we make decisions rationally. The way that you typically want to engage this system is to enable effective post-rationalization. I've got enough shoes to sink a ship. I don't need another pair of shoes. I go online to Shika, which is limited source, limited time sales, or whatever it is, and I find a beautiful pair of shoes. My, uh, maybe the primal side of the brain flashes up and it's like, there are red pair of shoes, I'll get more sex if I wear red because I know that, well, okay, that's the rational part, we'll rationalise it going, yes, well, I've read research that shows if a woman wear red, then the guy that they fancy is more likely to think of them in a sexual context, which is true, by the way. But anyway, so that's the post-rationalisation. So I'll emotionally and primally have made a decision, subconsciously, to take an action. What you can do as designers is to give people the rationale as to, oh, yeah, this is a good decision because... Um, you can do this through things like product demonstration and through listing specifications uh, and product information. Also things like giving evidence that things work, so proof, scientific, uh, rigor, clinical trials has proven X, Y, and Z. And also to be the authority, so being the expert in your field and recognized as such. Let's move into empathy. So I'm going I'm to start by asking what, what do we think empathy is? The first person to answer gets a copy of my book. What is empathy? I think we should just switch at this stage. This is brilliant. Um, but that's cheating because you're smart and you're a speaker and you, you know this field already. But yes, okay, so... so I <laughs> You definitely passed. Loads of different ticks. No, I meant I passed it to them. You can have it. Okay, who, who wants to have another shot after that really wonderful shot? Does anyone dare? Putting yourself in someone's foot. Oh, ooh, you got pipped to the post? No, no raised hands. No, oh, <gasps> very un-British. I can split it down the middle. Who wants the Solomon's baby? <laughs> You'll have the back part. The back part's a good bit. So is the front part. So, sorry, what was it that you said? <laughs> Putting yourself in someone else's place. Yes, yeah, so understanding someone else's perspective. They want to try your shoes on. Would you like to try my shoes on? <laughs> you may. That can be the second prize for anyone who wants to. They're very comfortable, actually. Okay, so, um, so yes, all of these things. Uh, so it's the ability to share and understand another person's perspective, emotion, cognitive state, or whatever it is. Okay, an interesting thing here is that we rely on being able to empathize with other people's feelings, to feel what other people are feeling, to understand their experience, because that's how you build social bonds. So things like cognition, emotion, and behavior, we can infer from other people's states, or what they're telling us with their bodies, with their nonverbals, with their verbal cues, what kind of state they're in, and how to respond and react to that other person. Okay, how many here have heard of mirror neurons? Good, good, educated crowd, go Brighton. Okay, so for those of you who don't know about mirror neurons, it's a very exciting field. So Rizzolatti and his colleagues, uh, an Italian guy at the University of Parma in the 1980s and 90s, were doing studies on um, motor neurons of macaque monkeys. 
And they're famous for this particular experiment in which they wired up these poor little monkeys to EEG machines. And they wanted to isolate the, um, the motor neurons that fired when they were place, picking up objects with their hands and placing them into their mouth. So food, essentially. So they set up this study. And in one particular case, they found that when the researcher picked up and ate some food, the monkey's brain activity would be the same as when the monkey ate and picked up the food. So it's this mirroring action. So whether the monkey was doing it itself or it was watching someone else do it, some of these neurons would fire. And in fact, it's been found that in this particular group, about 10% of the neurons would mirror the actions of another. It's also been found in humans to be the same case. This is a perfect example. I love this image. So you've got the little baby monkey, and you've got the tongue sticking out, and then you can see that it mirrors the action. Um, and that's something very simple. OK, so what's interesting about this is that it enables us, essentially, to mind-read other people, to make inferences about how they feel, what their position might be, and how they relate to us. So this particular quote is quite nice. It's a building block of human interaction. We rely on it to form societies and civilizations and to develop as an entire species. It assists in mind reading because it allows us to understand and to share the feelings of others. So, a little experiment for you now. I want you to look at these images, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, which of those images did you feel... Okay, did you feel this was... Um, this, did this make you feel good? No. no. Did that make you feel good? Yes. Did that make you feel good? No. What you find, and usually I have a much longer version of this, um, and you, you can do it in two rows. So one of them is to mirror, physically mirror the actions of the, or the facial expressions that you see, in which case you get a very strong version of that emotional state. What you also find is that you ask, if you ask people to keep a poker face, they find it very, very hard. It's, and when I was watching you watch those, the one in which you responded the most was the smile. Why? Because if I smile at you, you're more likely to respond because it facilitates connection and communication. And tribally speaking, if we weren't able to facilitate that with another person, we were more likely to die because you weren't part of the tribe. So that's kind of why these things work. It's also why you should be quite careful about the kind of images that you use. So don't use stock images because usually they're fake smiles and they don't extend to here and you're not going to elicit that same emotional state that you want to elicit. In fact, we looked a little bit at embodiedness earlier with MC, which is a fantastic presentation. And what I would like to just touch on briefly here is embodied cognition, or the idea that the brain does sit within a system that's the body, but the body can influence the brain. So things like, if you adopt certain facial expressions, like the ones that we've just taken, you will then also end up feeling, typically, the associated emotion. So if you're feeling really shit, and I've tried this, if you're feeling really shit, and you're kind of doing this, and you're walking around, everything's slumped, if you literally just pull your shoulders back, and you smile and you put your head up, or you can even adopt a power pose, which is what I always do before I come on to talk to sort of calm the nose, like that, or dominant positions like that, hooding, or if you're a you know, guy or wearing a pair of trousers, feet up on the cross legs on your desk, you know, these classic 1970s madmen poses. It's been found that actually it will raise your testosterone levels, and people who do that before interviews get rated, the, the interviewer doesn't know about it, get rated as being more confident, more relaxed, more intelligent, all of these different things. So there is something real to being able to elicit emotions through either showing someone that face that they can then instinctively empathise with or by getting them to adopt a particular thing themselves. And these are the six most powerful emotions to elicit if you want to change the state of your customer or of someone else. So you've got anger, which is quite strong. Fear, which is an interesting one, which you can move someone through a story from fear to hope. Happiness, which is lovely, which is why we, the, the world is filled with lol cats and all that kind of crap. Disgust, which I uh, alluded to earlier. Surprise, and then also sadness can be quite powerful if you move someone from a place of sadness, again, to something more active and more highly aroused. Interestingly, um, whilst these do all have an impact, it's the emotions that have a higher valence, a stronger kind of visceral response that will get people to, to kind of take a call to action more readily. So bear that in mind. It's also why we find these kinds of things funny, because it's not just restricted to humans. We, anthrop we anthropomorphize, and also it's been found that animals, of course, experience emotions. So a takeaway from this particular section, if we view particular emotions or facial expressions, we experience a change in state ourselves. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of this. Uh, this is sort of... I pulled it out because it gives you a sense of empathy, and I'm going to ask you at the end what kind of emotions you felt when you watched this, and if there are any gender differences. Okay. You may know this one already. Many men have a small problem.
Operation can be controlled. All right. What did you notice about that? What feelings did it elicit? Let's start, let's start with the men. What were they talking about? Okay. <laughs> yes. The clues in the name of the talk. Well done. Uh, what else? What else? Sorry? Sex. They made you think about sex. Yes. Brilliant. That's the primal. What else? Fear. Say again? Fear. Fear. Fear of what? Of being rejected. Yeah. Brilliant. So social isolation, strong emotion. What else? Embarrassment. Embarrassment. So shame, embarrassment of being unworthy or not being able to perform. Uh, what else? Oh. Hope. Yeah, the product. So you've got all these different elements. You've got these key elements, and you're moving from pain to pleasure. You're making something very concrete, um, and you're using these psychological techniques to target the primal, so sex, uh, the emotional, hope, sadness, kind of fear. Um, and then, well, the rational comes very, very far at the end. So 48 hours antiperspirant protection. Not that you're going to need any sort of convincing from a rational perspective at the end of that. Um, okay, women, what did you think of that advert? <laughs> Why was it pathetic? No, no, it was someone else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll ignore, we'll ignore the person. At the no, is it, is it, what, did, what did any of the other women think about that? Funny. 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 It is kind of funny. But what's interesting is that we don't have that same inbuilt fear of we're not going to be able to perform. So there's that whole sort of social narrative going through there, premature ejaculation, which is something that young men and probably most men fear about, which women don't have. So we're more likely to find that funny than fearful. Um, interesting. Okay. Right, another one. <laughs> All right. We're going to leave it. <laughs> Why am I showing you this video? No, I love men. I don't want to torture men. Why? Well, it's the men torturing themselves, let's face it. Got massive cojones. I can do this. And then, oops, not so much. Um, sorry. Um, and then you're going to need the premature perspiration thing because you'll be screwed. But hopefully not. Okay, so why am I showing you this video more seriously? Yes. You can um, induce, uh, you can uh, kind of think of the pain without seeing the pain. Yeah, and in fact, what I wanted to um, raise your attention bring your attention to. Before I even showed you the first scene, you saw the lines on the, on, on the so fail blog nut shots. How many of you at that point kind of winced? You know what's coming. And then how many of you winced when you knew exactly what was going to happen before it happened? I heard all of you, perhaps maybe one or two, but didn't kind of go, you heard each other speak, right? And then as soon as you do that again, and it doesn't matter that you're going to see it for a second time, it's still as painful the next time. And even if you're a woman, we don't, well, you know, if, if you're a woman, you're not going to do that kind of thing. You're not, you don't have the same anatomy. We all wince too, because it would still hurt. You aren't that person. As far as I know, none of you in that room was that guy, right? And yet you felt the pain. This is why these things go viral. It's also sort of schadenfreude. Um, but it's, it's because it, it emotes with us. It, it creates an emotional response and also sometimes a physical response. How many of you actually had a physical twinge when you saw that? I did. I'm not even a skateboarder. Right, OK, enough pain for now. Uh, so let's have a look at how you can use this in websites. I've got just a couple of examples here. The US are absolute pros when it comes to using some of these uh, psychological techniques in internet marketing stuff. This is a brilliant example, uh, Marie Forleo, who runs a business school. The first thing, typically, that you'll notice, because it's high contrast and it's at the top, which is the beginning of our perceptual path on websites, is um, typically the white on the black, the get, and then you'll tend to look at her face and then look back at the text. It's kind of bouncing between cues. But what's interesting, if you look at the top image, is her body language. One of the cues that we use to figure out, usually subconsciously, the state of another person's um, emotional lay of the land, or another person's emotional state. So she's laughing, she's looking away from the image towards the text, which as we heard earlier is a good way to get you to read the text, but also her arms are open. Um, MC was talking earlier about the protection of the squishy bits. This is the, this is the opposite. When you're feeling comfortable with someone, you open up your squishy bits because you're feeling like you're not going to get attacked. So this shows you straight away, it's sort of subconscious cues, you can trust me. The other thing that's interesting about this, she also uses a lot of images in her blog posts. So if you look at the image there, how many of you saw the image, or you have to sort of introspect here a bit, so it might be a bit dodgy, but how many of you looked at the image before you read the title? Did any of you do that? I always do that. 
because sort of, it's fast, it's, it's um, the most instantaneous way to gather information is visually. Uh, and here you'll see that she's looking quite overwhelmed. So the visual matches up, emotionally speaking, with the message in the text. So how to use social media so it doesn't overwhelm you. This is a really easy, very, very simple ploy to communicate your message quickly to people. So using empathy online. This is another example. Um, if people are going to buy from you, typically, unless you're trying to establish a state of fear from which you then move them into a state of um, comfort or safety, which is your product, we give you the safetyness or the safety, um, then you're going to want to get them to, to experience a positive state. So having people smiling is an easy, easy way to do this. But then you all knew that. Okay. We heard a little bit earlier about how when a speaker speaks, if you're engaged with them, the listeners' brains will ooh, hello, sorry. The listeners' brains will sync up in activity with a slight time delay. What's interesting is that this doesn't just happen in terms of speaking. So that's a very long quote. I should have memorized these before I came on stage because I thought I'd have cues. So basically, we have, uh, we have a tendency to mimic one another, not just in the way that we speak with one another, but also the, the synchronization of vocal expressions. So if I have a particular way of speaking, if we're in rapport, chances are that we'll start mirroring each other linguistically. Also, things like postures and movements. I don't know if you ever see this. Um, when you're on a date, if you're getting on really well with the person that you're on a date with, you'll tend to mirror their position, so like this. Or if you're seeing a family around a table and they're very comfortable, they'll tend to all drink at the same time. It's also when you see people using their phones, one person whips it out and then it's like, we're all going to get phones out, it's going to be fabulous. Um, so anyway, so we tend to converge emotionally with other people and also behaviourally, with a synchronisation earlier, with the beat um, and with the, with the stamping. What's interesting is that we don't even have to be doing anything actively for this to happen. So there was a study done by Friedman et al. in uh, 1980, and they found that if you have three people sitting silently in a room, facing one another, the most emotionally expressive, bear in mind this person is not moving consciously, the most emo emotionally expressive of those three people will transmit his or her mood onto the other two people within two minutes of sitting there together. That's insane. And it's also why if you have someone, for instance, in businesses, this is an interesting one, if you have a team and one of the people who's emotionally very express, uh, expressive goes through a depression or goes through some sort of difficulty, <laughs> emotionally speaking, the, the, the mood of the, the rest of the team often will track the mood of that single person. So you've got to have a little bit of um, introspection and being able to be aware of what your state is doing to other people. There, there's also another one which is looking at contagions. Which is this? Oh. Cute baby, isn't it? Does it make any of you want to yawn? How many of you are suppressing a yawn right now? I am not going to yawn in front of the psychologist. <laughs> and how many of you have yawned already? One. How many of you have yawned now? Oh, you are a hard crowd, you naughty people. How many of you are covering your mouths? Naughty. All right, so, okay, the next one is a slide that I threw in because last night, Monsieur Danny Hope over here um, let slip a little tip for those of you who are of the bearded persuasion. And that is beard conditioner. <laughs> so if any of you are sort of figuring out how best to quaff your beautiful man hair, this man hair, um, then, you know, beard conditioner, hashtag it, please, let's blow up the stream. And that's his... Uh, handle if you want to ask any questions. I'm going to try and make it a contagion of its own. Right, now, moving on. <laughs> so, um, neural coupling, we heard about a little bit earlier. There's a cum it's, it's basically the idea that communication is one act in which the brain of the listener, that's you guys in this case, and the speaker are trying to converge and act as one, uh, which is essentially this, which is why storytelling is so effective. But it doesn't just have to be storytelling that is verbal that can elicit this response. It can also be something like this. Well done, John Lewis. All right, how do you feel now after watching that? Shout. Really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> Sorry, right, we're only two months away. What else did you feel during that? You want to go shopping? You want to? <laughs> What are some of the things that you noticed that they did without any... Okay, so there's the words and the music, which is about love. But beyond that, what are some of the psychological things that you think that they did there? Facial expressions on the Yeah, just, just stick lines, you know, the sort of the, the determination when his eyes go a little bit, you know, and you've got the kind of the straight line and then the little happy face, I found what I'm looking for. And then the sort of the scared face when he's tracking and we don't know if he's going to melt. And 
What else? What else did you notice? I think they, they used a bit of cheesy music, turning it a bit more cheesy without overdoing it. So <laughs> everybody recognized the tune from being tranky to Hollywood, but didn't, probably did not know this verb. So everyone recognized the cheesy tune, but it wasn't too cheesy for it to be a sicky kind of. And it, kind of fun. Yeah, so it's something new, but it's, it's still familiar. Um, OK, so how many of you here have heard of The Hero's Journey, or The Hero with a Thousand Faces? OK, so that was a perfect example of how you get, I'm going to go through all the steps, but essentially, you've got a call to action or a call to adventure. The snowman wants to get his missus something beautiful for Christmas. They're not even real. Snowmen aren't real. Anyway, so standing there, and the, the sort of the cultural strip script, you've got, you know, the magic snowman, I'm walking in here, and then he dies, and it's all just horribly miserable for Christmas for kids. Anyway, that's besides the point. This has got a happy ending. This is what the snowman should have been, right? Anyway, so you've got the snowman, you've got the call to adventure, he's got to do something, he comes over, all these different challenges, you know, is he going to get killed by traffic and miserable kids, and then he gets past his challenges, his little bird helps him out, he's got a little guardian, and then he gets to the shop, he gets his stuff for his missus, and he comes back, and the whole world is sort of better, because he's managed to get the thing for his love. You can do all of this stuff, and play on the emotions here. I showed this to my fiancé uh, two days ago, when I was preparing these slides, and... Um, and it's about Christmas, and it's snowman, and I looked at him, and he was visibly choked up. And this is not like a particularly emotionally expressive person. I was like, what's going on? There's one and a half minutes of just snow, essentially. But you can see that empathy works, even when you're just telling something symbolically. OK, I'm going to stop waxy lyrical. We've got three minutes left. So five steps that you can use. This is kind of the sequence that I do when I'm creating content to, to use this research and use empathy online to get better results. So number one. Profile your audience. It comes back to that number one, know who you're targeting, the psychography of your audience. So find out what their age and their gender is. What kind of year were they born in? Can you use nostalgia, like that song? We recognize that song, but it's a new version. What kind of language are they using? Is it like totes and oats, or is it, you know, really professional? I don't know why I'm really professional. Anyway, so uh, what kind of interests do they have, and what kind of clothes are they, are they wearing? Are you going to reflect their aesthetic preferences, or are you going to try and jar, jar it with surprise by doing something completely opposite? What kind of body language do you want to evoke? And that includes facial expressions, like with the snowman. Number two, choose the state that you wish to elicit. And this can be several. It can be a starting state, so moving from pain into pleasure, or from discomfort into relief. And these are some of the ones that you can use, the six that I highlighted earlier. So anger, fear, happiness, disgust, surprise, and sadness. And you can use a combination of these. Then you need to be able, so that should say three, then you need to be able to design a narrative that they can understand and relate to on an emotional level. If you haven't checked out The Hero's Journey, check it out. It's a 12-step process that you can use to craft any content and see where it takes you. The fourth one is about choosing your medium. Um, stories can be told in a variety of ways. And I think if you're trying to be emotionally engaging, typically the richest, mediums, uh, the richest media will perform best because you're giving someone everything that they need to be able to feel an emotional state. So video tends to be best. Audio is also pretty good. You can also tell stories via text. Interestingly, if you use the word you more in a text, people will tend to respond to that on a much more emotional level. Why? Because you're being put at the center of the story. Just a bit of random research. And then imagery, which can also tell a lot. So things like before and after. Number five, analyze your results. How are you going to tell if this is a successful implementation of empathy and of this process if you don't have some KPIs through which to measure? So things like conversions. Do you get increased conversions? Is it a message that you're putting up or a video to get people to subscribe to something or to buy something? Views and likes are also very important. Easy tip, I'm sure all of you know this. Using different URLs to, to put across different channels to see where people are coming, which channels being the most effective. Click-throughs, shares, and embeds. Um, slide share is a great way to tell stories also. OK, that was a rather a whistle-stop tour. Here are some of the references. And if you want to find out more, you can go there. And if you want to tweet to me, I'm at the website. And I'll be around at the break, so you can collar me. Thank you very much for your time.